Hello and welcome to this week's edition of The Advance with Kevin Roberts. I'm your host, Kevin Roberts, and today we're going to cover a very difficult topic, that is the debacle that is underway in Afghanistan. We're going to do so as we usually do by reading reality truthfully, as I like to say. That is to say, we're not going to pull any punches, uh, we're not picking on anyone, but this is a crisis that demands, demands that every American, regardless of political affiliation, ask hard questions about American leadership, not just abroad, but really anywhere America is exerting leadership. By saying that, you know, Texas Public Policy Foundation's a nonpartisan entity. We don't take score when it comes to partisan affiliation. And we're certainly not going to pick on anyone who has the privilege and honor of occupying the office of President of the United States. Having said that, and I say this as a historian of American politics, it is difficult for me as a historian of American politics to think of other episodes in American history that are this tragic, this embarrassing, and this unnecessary. And so we're going to unpack that. We are, as we always do, going to take your questions as members of the audience, and we're hopeful that we can leave this conversation on an optimistic note, if not necessarily for the short term, at least for the long term for the United States. We're gonna be able to do that because we have a very special guest, and I, I mean that sincerely, someone who has spent her adult life, her professional career, not just advancing the interests of the United States abroad, but conducting herself in a way that is honorable as, as a, a member of the Trump administration most recently. KT McFarland was former Deputy National Security Advisor. She has a very long record of policy achievement in foreign policy. And you're going to be privileged, as I am, to hear her expertise about this issue. So we're going to get into some questions. But before we do that, KT, you and I both have on our minds what happened yesterday with the two bombings, uh, the, the unfortunate, tragic loss of life of everyone, but especially American service people. Yeah, you know, I, I think, put politics aside, it, it's just a gut punch when you think of the brave Americans who have sacrificed their whole careers, you know, for the for the good of the United States and our allies to see them now have this tragic um, unfolding of events in Kabul at the Kabul airport. And I agree with you. I think it was unnecessary. And but anyway, here we are. And that doesn't whatever the politics of it is, it doesn't it doesn't diminish the sacrifice and the nobility of the service to the United States. And so to all the families who are affected, to everyone who has a connection to the United States military, really hats off to you. I'm a Navy mom myself, and I just can't imagine what some families are going through right now and may continue to go through for the next couple of weeks. But God bless you all, and thanks of a grateful nation. Oh, amen. As, as we did yesterday at our monthly staff meeting, uh, we remembered those lives lost, as you said. Uh, those, those folks are there knowing what sacrifice they may have to give, which is to say their ultimate sacrifice. That's something for the rest of us, as I mentioned to my kids over dinner last night, that we ought never take for granted. And while you and I are going to delve into the policy and even some of the politics, as you just said so eloquently, that does not diminish that ultimate sacrifice that those 13 service members gave yesterday. And I would just ask everyone who's watching this, whether you're watching it live or you're watching it recorded, as I know many people will, never forget those people, those lives in your prayers and your thoughts. Those are families that will be changed forever. And one of the, the main motivations we have today in having this conversation and not pulling any punches when it comes to looking at the policy with objectivity and looking at solutions to that policy is to honor their lives. So KT, I, I mean it when I say we couldn't think of anyone better as we were putting together this broadcast to have as our expert on this than you. And I thank you for your service to this country. So the obvious first question is just to give us kind of the proverbial 30,000 foot view of, of what's going on in Afghanistan today, you and I are going to get into unpacking why what happened happened. But I think right now, given that events are changing almost by the hour, we'd appreciate your experience look at what's happening at this moment. Well, I think the tragedy is that we now we have American citizens that we're not going to be able to evacuate. And it's for a couple of reasons. One, 
because the American citizens may not want to leave because let's say they're married to an Afghan or they have Afghan children and they don't want to leave their families behind. We totally get that. But the other reason is because there are American citizens all across the country. You know, uh, three days ago, we were saying that all Americans get to Kabul, get to that Kabul airport, you're going to get on a plane. Then we saw with the bombings that Kabul airport wasn't safe. But I've spent a lot of time in Afghanistan over the years. And we have Americans in a lot of different places. You know, you, there may be two 25-year-old girls will be teaching school at a, at a girls' school in Western Afghanistan. And maybe we have two aid workers who are helping people in Northern Afghanistan make solar, solar-powered solar wells. I mean, we've got a pocket full of an American groups all over the country, and they have no way of getting out because they don't have armed guards. They don't even have cars probably to, to drive them, even if they could go from wherever they are into Kabul. And as we now know, you know, we've, um, Kabul airport probably isn't safe. I was just watching the Pentagon press briefing and they cannot guarantee that there won't be more terrorist attacks at the airport and at other places. And so I think that the issue today is the Americans are still there. I think they're gonna be ripe for hostage taking opportunities for the bad guys. So I'm concerned about that. And then I'm concerned of how are we getting out? Are we going to shoot our way out? It's, it's the situation in Afghanistan is really bad right now, but I worry that in the next two or three weeks it gets worse in Afghanistan. And that's that was the follow-up question I was going to ask you before we kind of go back in time and and dissect how we got here. And that is, am I wrong to conclude, even with my natural optimism, that it's going to get worse before it gets better? Yeah, I think so for, again, because we, we now look at the Taliban and they all look unified. This is like the Taliban military, but the Taliban isn't one group. It's about five different tribal groups, all sort of being affiliated with the Taliban. Sometimes they're affiliated with ISIS. They're affiliated all over the place. And I switch their loyalties all the time. They seem to be united right now, but in about 48 hours, they'll start fighting with each other. Each one of those groups is back. One is backed by China, one by Pakistan, one by Iran one by Russia. So they'll all start kind of going at each other in a multi-sided civil war. So any Americans there, I think, are very much at, at jeopardy being caught in that crossfire. But the second thing is that we now find out that the names and biometric information of a lot of the Afghans, allies who had helped Americans, is on lists that the Taliban has their hands on. So I do think it just gets worse before it gets better. And I don't know how much longer it's going to take before it gets better, but it's going to be decades. Yeah, I I was afraid of that. Well, we're going to press pause on the future. We will come back to that in in just a few moments. But first, want to be sure that our audience members get from you a sense of of how we got here in the first place. And and, and by that, I mean, let's, let's start with the first day that President Biden takes office. What did he and his advisors start doing differently than the Trump administration had been doing regarding their own plans to exit Afghanistan? Well, I'd like to actually go back even further than that. Um, We had every right to go in after September 11th and kill Al Qaeda and anybody who attacked Americans. And we did. And we did it with a, a small group of special forces. And we did it brilliantly. I mean, we adapted. We changed it. In three months, we got Al Qaeda surrounded. They were were down to like 200 fighters, including Osama bin Laden. And we had them with their backs up against the Hindu Kush mountains, the mountains that separate Afghanistan from Pakistan. And instead of finishing them off right then and there, somehow, and who knows how, they, they slipped through our fingers. So they slipped through the tunnels and the caves in those mountains, and they came out the other side in Pakistan in a very remote tribal region. So instead of finishing them off on the Pakistan side of the border, which would have been a good thing to do too, um, we just let them go. And we said to Pakistan, okay, you guys find Al Qaeda, you find bin Laden, you finish them off. And then we changed our mission, which I think was a really huge mistake. In December of 2001, we said, well, we're going to now nation build in Afghanistan. We're going to create a modern Afghan military, and we're going to create a democracy in a country that you know, has not really the most primitive, illiterate, tribal, brutal country in the world, we were going to create a modern democracy. So I think that's where the first and major mistake was made. And then for 20 years, American generals trotted up to Capitol Hill and they said, you know, a few thousand more American servicemen, a couple more billion dollars, maybe another six months or a year. We're going to have that Afghan military really in great shape. We're going to have a good government. We're going to have elections. It's going to be fair. It's going to be wonderful. And yet for 20 years, it was never going to happen. And they knew it. 
we had intelligence failures where the intelligence community, which had missed Al Qaeda in the first place, right? And they've missed everything that's happened in Afghanistan in the last two weeks. And I think they missed just about everything in between. You know, they had their expert predictions of what was going to happen. And frankly, I fault our political leaders, Republicans and Democrats, who kept sort of pushing us on mission impossible. The Afghan military, we were trying to create a modern military, you know, according to American standards, complete with all the bells and whistles, with a population which was mostly illiterate. I mean, I remember going to Afghanistan once and somebody saying, well, it's taking longer than we thought to train the Afghan military because we have to teach them how to read first so that they can then read our manuals. That was always gonna be just a mission that wasn't gonna work. And then as far as elections, it's a tribal nation. They vote with their tribe. Why did we expect them to be a democracy? And then finally, the corruption, the endemic corruption in Afghanistan, which has been, had that as a sort of way of doing business for two or 3,000 years, that wasn't going to change. So all of those things meant that the 20 year Mission Impossible was not going to happen. Fast forward to Donald Trump. I'm a member of the Republican Foreign Policy Establishment. I mean, card carrying member. I went to Oxford, MIT, majored in Chinese, worked for Henry Kissinger, worked in the Reagan administration. I mean, I was as sort of right in the middle of that foreign policy establishment as you could get. And yet I looked at the last 20 years of failure in American foreign policy. And so I supported Donald Trump. Um, and I abandoned a lot of the more traditional Republican candidates for president. In the Trump administration, he had a plan and they negotiated the plan and, he, and the plan rested on the following. We're gonna get out, we know that. But he went to the leader of the Taliban, the guy who's now supposedly running the country. And he said, we know where you live. We know where your family lives, where your children live. And you harm the hair on one head of an American. And we are coming to get, not just you, but your extended family, we're gonna wipe you out. And that sounds harsh, but that's exactly the kind of language they needed to hear. And as a result, we had a plan. People were leaving Afghanistan. American diplomats were leaving. American citizens were leaving. We were sort of slowly but surely with no fanfare, getting Americans out of there with the idea that we would be out completely by May of this year. And that was the schedule. It was conditions based. You know, if we had any problem that they were going to take American hostages, we were going to go come and get them. We were not just going to leave no matter what. It was a, a series of, of sort of milestones they needed to reach as we as we left. And yet the Biden administration, when they came in, they just hated everything Trump did. And they were just sort of this like allergic response to anything Trump proposed that they were gonna just do the opposite. They weren't even gonna analyze to see whether it made sense to do the opposite. They just did the opposite. So Biden comes in and instead of continuing to take Americans down, they added Americans. They put Americans back in and they stopped taking anybody out. And then President Biden said, well, we're gonna have now September 11th. That's where we're gonna get everybody out. Not, Trump's dopey deadline of May. Well, Trump's dopey deadline of May was chosen very deliberately, which is the Afghans don't fight 12 months a year. Taliban, none of them. No, they don't fight 12 months a year. In the winter months, like fall to six, seven months a year, they're off in the, in the mountains, they're in the caves, they're at their farms. They mm -hmm. don't fight in the fall, winter. Well, folks, obviously we're having some technical issues today and we'll get those ironed out. What we're gonna do, is conclude today's live stream. KT McFarland has done a wonderful job. There's a lot of expertise there. I would recommend to all of you that you read her book. What we will do is have her on a subsequent live stream. We'll get those technical details ironed out on both ends. We appreciate your patience. We appreciate you tuning in. Obviously, this is a time in American history that is not only unprecedented, it is, uh, this is not exactly the repeat of the fall of Saigon in 1975. It's worse, it's less orderly. It comes from a, not just a crisis in leadership, a, a, a real explosion in weakness, if you will, but also it comes from a real lack of vision in the future. This is precisely what those of us who work on policy were worried about when this administration came into office. So once again, thanks for your forbearance when it comes to technical issues. I have some theories about that, all of which have to do with China but we're gonna get those ironed out. We'll have KT here in person and we will not merely rebroadcast a cleaner version of this, but we'll have her back for an update on what's going on in Afghanistan. Thanks so much for joining us today.